Good morning. And a very warm welcome to everyone here in the church and everyone watching online. It's lovely to have sunshine this morning after so many dull, cloudy days last week. I should have conducted the service here on Sunday the 2nd of January, as as my husband and I had to self-isolate as our daughter who stayed with us over Christmas tested positive for COVID on Boxing Day. To be honest with each and every one of you, I wept my way through that service. And to anyone watching who doesn't know what I'm talking about, <coughs> the Phil Hawthorne, who was the youth worker for the past seven and a half years at Newton Wallace Town Church, and only 36 years of age, passed away on the 30th of December. I believe that God inspired Gary to use just the right words at the beginning of the service, and he gave Sheila the courage to read the poem, Just One Life. God, God strengthened both of you to conduct worship that Sunday morning. It was such a sad, sad Sunday. But I know God was also with Dot and the praise band as they sang the meaningful hymns. That service was one of great dignity that day. I know many of you have watched the service of thanksgiving and celebration for Phil's life in the Normandy Hotel on Friday afternoon. And grateful thanks to everyone, to you, Neil, for being this recording. And I know we learned much more about Phil's short but full life. In his own unique way, Phil showed love to everyone, everywhere in the body of Christ, and also to those who had no faith. He was always witnessing for his love for God, and he touched so many people in his short life, including all of us here in Newton Wallace Town Church. And now the intimations for today. The following are the funeral times that have been arranged for the two, two church members whose death were announced on the last two Sundays. This is Betty Kelly. Her funeral service will be held on January the 25th at Mason, Tuesday, the 25th of January, at Mason Hill Crematorium at 1.15 p.m. And Mrs. May Dickey, the funeral service will be held on Thursday, the 27th of January, also at Mason Hill Crematorium at 1.15 p.m. And could all the organizations please complete their accounts and hand them to Janice Meredith or Phil McInespy at the church for auditing. And I'll be on holiday from Monday the 20, 17th of January to Monday the 24th of January. And as always, sincere thanks to Gary McCleary for covering pastorally during this week. A call to worship this morning is from Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. So let us worship God, singing together, Praise is Rising.
Now Jane's going to speak to the boys and girls. And everyone. I am. Oh, what a relief. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone at home, and good morning, boys and girls. It's wonderful today to see so many young people in the church. So great to see you. Right, so today I'm going to do, show you some things. Last week, Pauline actually brought along a television controller. You remember that? She brought a television controller, and she was teasing us that those things weren't around when some of us were younger. So that got me thinking, and I thought, OK, what's been around since I was young? Might have changed in style, might have modernised, but what's around that you use now that I still use? So, going through my cupboards at home, I got a few things. First thing, what's this? What does it shout out? It's a torch. This torch... I actually keep in my backpack so when I'm travelling and things and I'm going somewhere, I can see if I get to a, a door or something and it's dark and I can see. And so it's quite useful. But I know, because you're very modern, of course a lot of you will have on your phones. How many of you got torches on your phones? How many? Tess, you've got one? Adults, you'll have one. Some of you won't know how to use them, but you'll have them. Um, um, now, this one, I absolutely love. I've never had to use it. And, of course, if you go to these concerts, you see them all. Not that I've ever done it, and I'm not likely to in the future, I'm at the moment. But they, you see them swaying. And, of course, this one on my phone, which is really bright and gives lots of light, it actually, I've never worked out how to do it, does an SOS. So if I was stuck somewhere, I could have my SOS. Now, other things I want to show you to do with... Light, bright lights. Now, I'm hoping that this works. I borrowed this from Nick. So, let's just have a look. How about that? Is that not the coolest thing going? Look. Cool. <laughs> Imagine that with your mask. <laughs> a whole new fashion item. Now, believe it or not, boys and girls, you may think this looks funny, but many times I have been proved wrong when Nick and I have been going for a walk and it's got dark and suddenly he brings out this head torch and it lights the way. So how many of you, have any of you actually got one of these? Oh, you two have got one. Tess, have you got one? And do you use it? Not very often, but you do have one. And uh, so you, do you use yours? What do you use them for? So when, did you say when you're camping? Yeah, thank you. So when you're camping, an absolutely great idea when you have to go out from your, your tent or wherever you are, having one of these, because the other thing is if you're holding one, you can drop it, can't you, the torch? So, but not. what about this one? Look at this. Well, would any of you have any idea? Look at that. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I'll dazzle you now. How many of you, how knows what this might be from? Because it's not a normal torch. Does anyone have an idea? It's got a sort of attachment. Tess, can you think what this could attach to to give light when it's really dark? A bike. Well done. Now, Nick Sibley, help me out. Is it a rear or a front light? Is it a front light? Yeah. It's red, the back light, isn't it? Yeah, got to get this right. Okay, so... The whole point of this, if I can turn it off, <laughs> the whole point is all of these things give light. Oh, I've got another one in here. I think you could attack someone with this one, look. Well, this one's quite dumb, dim, but actually, that's another light. So, all about light. And that got me thinking, light is very important. We rely on lights to show us the way to go. If you look at the lighthouses off the coast of Scotland, they are so important still for making sure that the ships and the boats out there know not to, av know to avoid all the dangerous rocks. So light is so important. And that got me thinking, boys and girls, what about how could we be a light 
not a physical light where we're flashing like these in my bag. How could we, as human beings, as people, as little children, as grown-ups, how could we be a light to other people? How could we shine so that in our lives, people will see a light that might point them to Jesus? Any ideas? How could we, in the way we live, in the things that we do every day, could we be a light for Jesus? Any ideas? Yes. Can I ask you to stand up and take your mask off? Because then I can hear you properly. Wow. Thank you so much. Be kind to each other. So the way you live, be kind to each other. So it's not you don't need to walk around with a torch, but that is a light. Any other ideas for a light? Tess, have you got any other ideas how we could be a light to other people? Think about it. Tess, take your mask off a minute. Smile at me. <laughs> that is a light. Can I just tell you, during lockdown, when we did the food bank, and you used to be skating back and forth up the drive, you were an absolute joy to us the way that you were there smiling with not a care in the world. <laughs> and you know something? It absolutely blessed me so much seeing her each week doing that. Right, church. So all of us can be lights. All of us can shine a light into the lives of others. And isn't it a great legacy if we can be a light for other people that points them towards the way we are because we have faith in Jesus. And there are lots of verses in the Bible, boys and girls, and one of them, and I just want you to remember about lights this week, lights, lights by saying kind things, light by a smile, but what Jesus says in the Bible, and this is from the Youth Bible, and it comes from Matthew verse five, um, chapter five, verse 16. Make your light shine. Ben, Tess, all the people in the church, so that others will see the good that you do and, you, and they will praise your Father in heaven. Okay? So that's our message today. Every time you see a light, oh, one still on. There you go. Run the batteries out. Fortunately with Jesus, we never run the batteries out. Okay. So I think there's a song now, isn't there? Going to sing, Lord, the light of your love is shining. Shine, Jesus, shine.
now the boys and girls will go through to Sunday school. Thanks to you, Jane, talk this morning. And now we have our prayers of adoration and confession. Later in the service will be prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. But let us pray. Almighty God, we've come together this morning to praise you. We've come into your presence to remind ourselves of all that you've done, both in our lives and in our church, all that you are doing and all that you will continue to do. Help us, we pray, not only to lift up our voices, but also our hearts. Help us to be united in prayer in both mind and spirit, and to hear your word for us today. Lord God, you've blessed us in more ways than we can remember. Your goodness is greater than we can possibly imagine. Your love is beyond anything we can truly understand, and yet, we know that you are a re living reality in our lives and you give meaning and purpose to each day. But loving God, before we continue to worship you, we have to bring before you our prayers of confession. There are times when, especially in January, we feel down and we fail to thank you for your great gift of life in all its fullness. We thank you for the message of the gospel, the good news of your unfailing love, your unchanging purpose, your unending mercy. Forgive us, Lord, that we fail to respond as we should. Forgive us for so often failing to appreciate everything you have given us. We become over-familiar and unmoved by it all, more concerned with what we do not, do not have than what we do have. Too often, we're preoccupied with the negative instead of the positive. Forgive us, Lord, that we fail to respond as we should. Teach us, we pray, to enjoy life in all its fullness, to celebrate your love in all its riches, and to share the joy that we have known with others. Lord, you've blessed us so richly. Help us to respond to you. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us hear the word of God. The passage will be read this morning by Kay Bell. This morning's Bible reading is taken from Luke's Gospel, ch chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. The boy Jesus in the temple. Every year the parents of Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they went to the festival as usual. When the festival was over, they started back home, but the boy Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. His parents did not know this. They thought he was with the group, so they traveled a whole day and then started looking for him among their relatives and friends. They did not find him. So they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. On the third day, they found him in the temple, sitting with the Jewish teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his intelligent answers. His parents were astonished when they saw him, and his mother said to him, My son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been terribly worried trying to find you. But he answered them, Why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand his answer. So Jesus went back with them to Nazareth, where he was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. Jesus grew both in body and in wisdom, gaining favour with God and men. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. 
Thank you, Kate. We sing together now the hymn, Father, I place into your hands. for our sermon this morning is the silent years. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel, we heard it verses 41 and 42, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to their custom. The Passover was one of the great festivals of the Jews. This was the time when they remembered the miraculous way that God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt and the angel of death passed over the homes of the people of God. The Passover usually took place in April and always took place in Jerusalem. Jews from all over the world at that time gathered in Jerusalem and many of them saved for a lifetime to celebrate the Passover in the holy city. Careful preparations were made for the Passover. Roads were leveled and for six weeks beforehand, the story and the meaning of the Passover would be taught in every home and preached about in every synagogue. It's about 90 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem and the journey would take about a week. Psalm 122 begins, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. We'll never know what Jesus thought or felt when he was old enough to understand the importance of Jerusalem. We imagine that he would be thrilled to see the holy city. I will always remember back in 1995 when I was in a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, we stopped to see the monastery of St. George built in a rock face not far from Jerusalem. The leader of the group was the late Reverend Chrissy Lane, at that time minister of Girdle Toll Church in Irvine, and our sister Jean was over from America and with us on the pilgrimage. As we walked back to the church, Jean sang the holy city, and I thought, never again 
will I actually see Jerusalem? It was in the distance, but I could see Jerusalem as these words were sung. It was very moving, and as I said, it's something I'll never forget. It's possibly that it was in the temple in Jerusalem that Jesus recognized that God was his father. During the years ahead, Jesus would have to discover when to begin his ministry. If he began too soon, he might begin without the necessary preparation. If he waited too long, he might never begin at all. Jesus had to wait for the call of God before setting out. We're told at verse 42 that Jesus was 12 years old when he said that he was in his father's house and we know he was about 30 years old when he was baptized by John in the river Jordan. 18 years is a long time to wait but it was during these silent years that Jesus was preparing for his task and learning all the time. Heard at verse 52 and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favour with God and men. To discover some of the things that Jesus learned during these silent years, we have to look at different parts of the gospel. Jesus must have learned to read, because we're told in Luke chapter 4 at verse 16, he read the scriptures in the synagogue. We know too that Jesus learned to write, because in John chapter 8 at verse 6 we read, he wrote in the sand with his finger. One of the great gaps in our knowledge is that we do not know what Jesus looked like, looked like, but during these silent years, he must have learned the meaning of family life and how to be a carpenter. Jesus would have to learn to cope with unreasonable people. He would see people at their best and at their worst, and at home, there would be all the problems of family life. At times, we all have problems with our families. As we know, there's no perfect family here on earth, just as there's no perfect person except for Jesus. It's very comforting, therefore, when some situation seems impossible in our eyes and we cannot see the way ahead, to know that Jesus understands. When we pray to our Heavenly Father, we can be assured that because Jesus lived here on earth as part of a family, then he understands our problems and we can leave them safely in his hands. As we sang, Father, I place into your hands my friends and family. Father, I place into your hands the things that trouble me. Father, I place into your hands the person I would be, for I know I always can trust you. It was during these silent years that Jesus learned to love God's world and see God in creation. Jesus grew up in a lovely part of Palestine. Reverend Sela Merrill, in his book in Galilee, written in the late 19th century, lists the trees that grew there at that time. They include the vine, the olive, the fig, the oak, the palm, the cedar, the cypress, the balsam, the sycamore, the almond, the pomegranate, and the oleander. And out in the country, Jesus would see the farmer sowing the seed, corn ripening under the hot sun, the mustard bush with the birds trying to pick up the little black berries, little black seeds, and the lovely flowers blooming on the seaside, on the hillside. Jesus was always learning that whatever happened in life, there were glimpses of the truth and the glory of God. Jesus would see the yeast when the bread was being baked, and he saw what happened if someone tried to pour new wine into old wineskins that had lost their ability to stretch. He saw the joy of a wedding feast. He watched the fishermen with their nets and the shepherd with the sheep. As Jesus lived among the people, he saw the beauty of nature and learned to see how God was at work in everyday life. I wonder, do we really think about God's action in our everyday lives? Do we turn and think about God when certain things happen in our lives? Often it's when things don't work out the way we plan, 
an unexpected visit or a telephone call, missing a bus or meeting a person in the seat or seeing a lovely smile when we're feeling down. The list could go on and on. But if we learn to see God in everyday life, then we will praise and thank him more and more. And it must have been during these silent years that Jesus learned how to pray. Time and time again, we read that Jesus withdrew from people to be alone with God. In each of the four Gospels, there are frequent references to the prayer life of Jesus. Sometimes we know what he said, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane or in the Long Prayer in John chapter 17, but other times the content is hidden. We do know that he spent the whole night in prayer before he chose his disciples, but there are no more details. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, we read that after Jesus heard the tragic news that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he said to his disciples, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. But the crowd saw them leaving in the boat, and they hurried ahead of them to the other side of the lake. And this led to the feeding of the 5,000. But as we read at verse 46, after leaving them, Jesus went up on a mountainside to pray. We know that for many people, prayer is a universal reaction to a crisis or some desperate situation. For many people, Prayer is only connected with life when something goes disastrously wrong. Of course, at such a time, prayer is essential. But what a difference it makes when prayer is a constant part of our lives each and every day. As the well-known hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And prayer is simply bringing all of life to God. Prayer is remembering that God is not only the rescuer when things get beyond us, but the friend who's with us all the time. Let us remember too that prayer is not an escape, it's a way of conquest. Prayer doesn't usually mean that we have to avoid, we're able to avoid a terrible situation, but it helps us to overcome and face these circumstances. As we know, Jesus prayed to avoid the cross, but that cup of suffering was not taken away from him. But he was strengthened to face the cross and emerged on the other side in triumph. Prayer does not give us an easy way out. It's the basic rule of prayer that God will not do for us something that we can do for ourselves. For example, our parents know that if, <coughs> that if they help and do the child's homework for them, then the child will not make any progress. It's much better to help the chi child to work through the homework that they have for themselves. Prayer does not mean that we escape from any situation, what, but what we can accept, expect is a strength that is not our own that helps us to bear the unbearable. And what about when our prayers are not answered? Why was Phil Hawthorne not healed? A young man of 36 years of age with a two-year-old son, a baby on the way, and someone who loved God so much and was such a wonderful example and witness to Christ. I know members of this congregation have been wondering why. Why did this have to happen? It was so cruel and so unfair. And yet, as we all know, there are times in life when it isn't fair, things that happen, and circumstances in life sometimes are very cruel. And sometimes there are no answers. I know some people have felt angry and anger is a part of the grieving process. Some of the psalmists were angry with God, and God always wants us to be honest with our feelings. But one of the elders in this church said to me 
Some good must come out of this. And that is absolutely correct, although it is hard to see just now. If only just one or some of the young folk in room 60, to whom Phil shared so much of his faith, could find their way to a personal faith in Jesus, that would have pleased Phil so much. He was so gifted with these young folk, just as he was so friendly with everyone here in this church. So often we think about the great moments in Jesus' life, or one of the miracles or healing stories, but this morning we've thought about a different aspect, the silent years. It's because Jesus lived through these 18 years, we know he understands family problems, we know he saw God in creation and in the ordinariness of everyday life. And we know that in these silent years, Jesus learned how to pray. As we trust Jesus, as we lean on him, then we truly know what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Let us sing together the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. prayers of thanksgiving, our prayers of intercession for others. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we thank you this morning for the world you've given us, for everything that speaks to us of creation, even in the winter months. We thank you for the gift of love given and received, and for your great love poured out each and every day. We thank you for family life with all its ups and downs and for the church family here in Newton Wallace Town Church. We thank you for our food, our clothes and our homes, for all the comforts we enjoy and the innumerable ways in which you provide for us. Loving God, in the way that Jesus saw you constantly at work in the world around us, around him, Help us to see you in both the ordinary and the special times of life, so that we may know you more fully and serve you more truly. You've blessed us so much. Receive our praise and our thanksgiving. 
Gracious God, as we turn our thoughts to pray for others, we think first of Ruth, of little Lewis, of Phil's parents, his brother and sister, and all the other relatives. We give you thanks that through our modern technology, we could see the service of thanksgiving and celebration for Phil's life on Friday afternoon. Continue to bless, strengthen, uphold his family in the difficult days that lie ahead. Now we pray for the families of the two church members who have recently lost a loved one. Bless Marlene and Brian, Betty Kelly's daughter and son, and all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Bless too, May Dickie's niece Alison, her nephew Ward, and all the other relatives. And Lord, we ask your blessing on all those we know who have been bereaved recently. And we pray for all those who are ill at the present time. We pray for Heather McLeod temporarily in the Ayrshire Hospice, and for Betty McPherson and Ken McAlpine still in the Bigot Hospital. May each member of their families know your strengthening care and comfort each and every day. Lord God, when we see the pictures of what is happening in Afghanistan on our television screens, we want to turn away. But we pray that more aid and supplies will be sent out to that country with the looming humanitarian crisis. Due to the Taliban rule, the people have no money and the children are dying of malnutrition this winter. Lord God, we pray for all those giving assistance to and in that country. And we ask your blessing on Newton Wallace Town Church, giving thanks for the way people have reached out and supported one another when they heard the news about young Phil. And this morning we give thanks for those who have died in the faith, especially those known to us who have now entered into the joy and peace of your eternal presence. May we follow their example and come with them to joy to share in the glory of everlasting life. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The closing hymn this morning is, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found.
May the love of Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of Jesus strengthen you in his service. And may the joy of Jesus fill our hearts. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.